Welcome to episode one of The Book Table, brought to you by Backroom with Spring Productions. In today's episode, we'll be discussing and reviewing An Ember in the Ashes by Saba Tahir. We'll begin with a general spoiler-free discussion, and we'll give you due warning before we begin our spoiler-laden section later. We're going to start with some brief introductions so you know who you're talking to. So let's start with you, Shelly. Okay. So I'm Shelly. I'm currently living in Georgia, studying robotics. What else? Clearly didn't plan this out. <laughs> Spontaneous. We love it. So, yeah, I love, you know, reading mostly fantasy and doing crafts like knitting and crocheting and playing video games. That's about it. I'll stop it. Hey, who's next? All right, I'll go next. Um, Hello, I'm Edlen. I live in Richmond, Virginia, where I work as a creative producer with a local broadcast company. Um, I did previously work at a Barnes and Noble, so for all of you who say you want to work in a bookstore, just let me tell you, um, you might not want to. It's a whole different level of crazy, but through that, um, got reintroduced to my love and love of reading, and uh, so I read just about anything I can get my hands on. I tend to read a lot of young adult, a lot of fantasy and science fiction, and uh, also I am very lucky in that I'm an early reader on NetGalley, so I tend to read a lot of very early um, advanced reader copies of books, which, let me tell you, is fun but also a little annoying because you can't talk about them with anybody. So you can just sit for like months and months and just not say anything. But so, yeah, outside of reading and doing all things movies and creative, um, no, actually, I don't do anything else. I have no life. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I'm Rebecca. I currently am living in South Bend, Indiana. So exciting. Uh, I recently graduated from the University of Chicago with a master's in religious studies, and most of my life tends to be a lot like that, where I just kind of do the stuff that I like to do, and most of that involves reading and writing. Um, I read a lot of fantasy, and that's pretty much it. We also have someone else um, who's going to be popping back in later. He had to step out for a minute. Uh, uh, but we'll... I'm back. Oh, you're back? Oh, he's back. All right, Aki, let's hear yeah. about you. Is South Bend a suburb of Chicago, by the way? It's not. It's like 90 miles outside of Chicago. It's in Indiana. Um, but, I mean, it might as well be because Indiana is, you know, Indiana. So. Like, what is in South Bend? Um, pretty much the only thing in South Bend is actually the University of Notre Dame. And then, of course, oh. St. Mary's College, where I graduated undergrad. Um, so, it's, I mean... Notre Dame is the largest employer in our county, so it really is like that's what South Bend is. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame. I knew South Bend sounded familiar. I was like, why do I know that? And then you said Notre Dame, and I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you must get really sick of hearing the Rudy theme song everywhere you go when somebody says that, right? You know, actually, I don't hear it. I just hear the fight song everywhere all the time. Oh, God. So My high school used the Notre Dame fight song as our fight song. Well, like the tune. No. That's funny. <laughs> <sighs> okay, but Aki, really, tell us about yourself. Um, yeah, so I'm a key, and I am a human being. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. I was wrong on that one. <laughs> so I used to be a journalist until about a week or two weeks ago, and in that capacity, I would write and edit a lot, but now I am a PhD student, and I am doing my PhD in international relations, and I have been in Washington, D.C. for, like, the last, like, eight years. Cool. And, um, yeah, I've always, like, reading fantasy books, but I took a little, like, hiatus, like, kind of in college, where I didn't read as much as I used to, but then I picked up again, because... Reading fantasy is, like, a really good way to forget, like, all the other intellectual, like, reading I have to do and, like, take a break. And so it's, it's, (laughs) yeah, so it's really welcome. It's, like, a welcome diversion. Sweet. Awesome. All right. Well, then let's go ahead and get started in this awesome discussion. Um, So let's start with our overall reactions. Um, Did you guys enjoy it, not enjoy it? What are your, like, big impressions of the story in general? I have so many problems with this book. <laughs> I, I want to go last because I need to contain my rage, but I will say that as much as like I have a lot of disappointment over this book, and I don't think 
it's not entirely the book's fault. I do chalk a lot of it to the marketing, and this book got a lot of pre-release hype and marketing. I mean, you couldn't escape it for, like, the whole six months prior to its release. Um, so I admit a lot of my own anticipation is probably also keyed into the marketing, but, uh, yeah, I had a lot of dis- disappointment and issues with this book. However, because, and I know we're going to talk about her later, because Helene is in here, I will read book two. It's the only <laughs> thing to me around. You gave it a pretty high rating on Goodreads. So. I'm pretty I was kind of confused with that. Yeah, I did. I gave, like, one, there's no half stars, which really blows, because I want to give it, like, a 3.5, but I rated it up to a 4 only because I would read the next book. But again, this is only because of Helene, and I think she's literally the, like, one redeeming factor of this book. Um, I think it was, I think I enjoyed it a little more than you did, man. Um, yeah. but I definitely also was disappointed. I think part of it was the hype. It was just like so much hype around it. And I was so excited about reading it. Um, I actually like killed it in two nights. It was almost one, but then I got really tired and finished it the next night. Mm-hmm. And I just felt everything felt kind of flat to me. I think that was my overall impression of the story is there was a lot of potential, but then nothing really came of the potential. There were a couple of things I really enjoyed, but for the most part, I was just kind of like, okay, but come on. Like, yeah. this could have been awesome, but then it wasn't really awesome. And this cool idea was introduced, but then you didn't really go anywhere with it. And so I think that was kind of what bothered me when I put it down and was done with it is that I just felt like there was so much potential and like none of it was really reached. And I don't know if that's just because there's going to be, I think we've found out four books in this, series and so there's a lot that was maybe just world building and like kind of like ground setting foundational stuff in this book but it was kind of just really frustrating for me as a reader I somehow thought it was a trilogy but (laughs) because it's YA we all just assume it's a trilogy (laughs) well Shelly did you say you went to the talk earlier and that she had said four books no I said that at at the talk she said well she said maybe Um, she's like I don't think she has it all planned out. Actually. I think she um, said that she doesn't really plan out things, but she does do a lot of rewrites. Cool, I guess. So she's what George R. Martin would call a gardener. She just kind of writes and then goes back to it. I never heard that comparison before. Really? He calls them like architects and gardeners. He says he said that like with types of writers, like the architect are the people who do tons of pre-writing and tons of um, like outlining, and they know exactly how everything's going to end and pretty much where everything's going to go with a general idea. Whereas gardeners kind of like they have a general idea of where things are. They don't necessarily plan it all out all the time. They just kind of start writing and see where it goes. And that means they often do a lot of rewrites. Because, like, I think George R. R. Martin has called himself, he's more of a gardener. And he tends to go back and do a lot of rewrites and changes, just depending on where he kind of organically is going with it. So, so Shelley did make a point that, like, um, she enjoyed it more because, like, he didn't, she wasn't necessarily looking at the book through the lens of history. But I think whether or not you look at it through the lens of history, um, it's still it's still like totally written as a story as well. Like there's just a lot of like implausible things happening. Like the characterization is not that great. Um, the world building isn't that great. Um, characters do things that like you wouldn't expect them to do, or like it seems like really random, or things just like work after them like all of a sudden. So it's kind of it wasn't satisfying as a story. And obviously, from a historical like perspective, like the author could have done better research. So, yeah. oh. so I mean, I, I, like, like, um, like everyone else said, I was disappointed. Um, it was overhyped, but since I'm not like big on young adult stuff anyway, and like I knew like it would be watered down to begin with, like I didn't think I had super high expectations in the first place. But, but I, I was definitely pretty disappointed. Yeah, I have to say, when you mentioned that she only liked, she didn't know anything about really ancient Rome, but had just liked it for the clothes, I think I almost started screaming, because that upset <laughs> me so much. I mean, I'm sure she, in the process of, like, doing her research on ancient Roman clothes, she read about, like, some history and so on, you know, like, like she's, yeah. not, a, she's not a fiction writer either, like, her background is journalism. So she should know how to do research, and she should know, like, if she's doing journalism, she knows, like, basic, like, political history things, I would think. I would think, but then that just makes me question why, like, one of the biggest selling points of this book was that it was based on ancient Rome, and 
I'm like, I'm, I didn't major in ancient Roman history, but I took, you know, five years of Latin and a whole bunch of Italian. And my grandfather's a retired classics professor. I've sort of been surrounded by that the classical atmosphere my whole life. Yeah. Uh, but I read that book and I just went, I mean, within 10 pages, I was just went, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Absolutely not. And the fact that it did feel just like, I don't understand why we called this ancient Rome. If it was just so we could use the word centurion and create a camp, a martial camp layout that included like a coliseum, then I find that really distressing um, because it just it didn't make any sense. Also, I mean, again, to point on the marketing, the fact that this was marketed as a standalone is absurd. I mean, just absurd. Whoever thought to even do that should be fired because it's not. It's not a standalone. Yeah. Well, what was interesting about that is that it was marketed for so long as a standalone, and then right after it came out, you could find on Amazon the like Ember and the Ashes two marketing. Yeah. Um. So it was it was weird. It was like the marketing wanted you to read it and think that you didn't have to commit to a series, but they obviously knew that you couldn't read this and not know that it was part of a series. Like, it ends without any, like, major plot stuff figured out. Like, it's clearly a setup for a series. And oh, yeah. so, it, I mean, I think that was, like, what the compensation was sort of on Amazon is like, oh, don't worry, though, it's not actually a standalone, which was yeah. really weird. Yeah, it feels kind of dishonest and really manipulative. And the thing is, is even with books, from what I've gathered from the publishing industry, where you're not really sure if you're going to get a series because oftentimes it's so dependent upon how well the first book does. Uh, even then, you write a standalone with sequel potential. This one isn't even that. I mean, it's just very obviously a setup because nothing is even close to resolved by the end of the book. I mean, nothing. I think that they they knew what they were doing when they were marketing it, though. Like, they knew the book sucked. Like, they must have read it. Like, <laughs> but, like, that's the thing. Like... <laughs> <laughs> they, they decided that okay, we're run. You know, we're we're done with Hunger Games. Like we're done with Harry Potter. Obviously, like we need to create the new like next young adult like marketing like craze, whatever it is. And like sometimes they just like pick out like something random and like just build it up. And it might be like they're like, oh, um, it's slightly different. Like we can like maybe like. Hey, she's a minority, and like, be like, hey, a minority wrote a best selling young adult book, and like, you know, we'll roll with that. Like, there's a lot of factors, like, out there, I think, that just made them decide to, to some extent, just like, go do self arbitrarily. Yeah, I and said, I wonder if that was part of the, the huge hype about it being based on ancient Rome, and why, I wonder if that's why the marketing, um, campaign was so heavy on that fact, is because it kind of sets it apart from the general like YA fantasy world where you have the sort of like European medieval sort of setting for a lot of these books. Um, but then what happened then is that you picked up the book with the expectation that it was really going to feel like an ancient Roman fantasy and it just absolutely was not. So yeah. And even then, if you weren't going to do it like full on ancient Rome, there are ways of doing it. I mean, I, these aren't young adult necessarily, but you have things like Jim Butcher's The Furies of Calderon series basically takes ancient Rome plus like Pokemon. And like, and it's really, I, I'm not even kidding. It's really wild. Yeah. The, or, uh, the Furies of Calderon, the series I think is called, uh, called the Codex Alera, but the first book is called The Furies of Calderon. I'm in the middle of reading it now. It's pretty wild. But there's that, and there's things like Pierce Brown and the Red Rising trilogy. He incorporates Hellenic and Hellenistic aspects to a futurist Mars. So I'm like, there are ways of doing it. But I just felt like this one, it was, she picked, like, a couple random words and then said, look, <laughs> this is very, like, I'm now going to make this into Roman. It felt nothing like it. And even then, yes, she used the word centurion. Yes, she used Roman gens crinomia, which are family names and first names. Like, okay, that's cool and all, but nothing else really goes with the idea. And so it, it just overall felt so shallow. Like, there were these great ideas, and I, I think it was it you, Becca, who said there were like all these great ideas, but they really weren't delivered upon. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's kind of the whole thing about this book was there was a lot of potential for things, but they just were not delivered upon, like in the really in the slightest. And that for me was so distressing because there were all these blurbs for it from so many people. I mean, Brandon Sanderson blurbed it. Brandon Sanderson, why do you do this to me? Why? <laughs> I trusted you. <laughs> well, I do think a lot of authors basically just like pat each other's backs to get the book sold. Oh yeah, no, they, they've talked about this. They're like blurbs are basically useless. I mean, like, they, like don't ever listen to them. And I'm like, I know. I I actually rarely do. This was one of the few occasions I did that in Storm Dancer by Jay Kristoff because Patrick Rothfuss gave the best blurb on that book's cover. Well, Shelly. Do you want to, especially because you have a slightly more positive perspective, do you want to try to chime in here a little bit so we don't sound like Debbie Downer as well? <laughs> it's been a while since I read it, so I'm kind of like trying to remember what exactly it was that I liked it, liked about it. Um, I guess part of it is that I don't have as much of a like a history background, so I don't really know like that much about you know what the ancient Romans exactly should have been like or what you know what the elements whether she used elements that she used well or things like that um and also part of it is because i didn't really pay attention to the hype as much like i did see a lot of people talking about this book and i knew like this this this, this book was pretty popular but i didn't really know what the subject was even that little you know a based on ancient rome fantasy blurb that's been going around like i just didn't pay any attention i guess Somehow I missed all of it. So basically, I didn't have that going in, and I guess it helped me sort of just accept what she put together. Although I still, mm-hmm. I still do think that it didn't have as much depth as I would have liked. And it is her debut novel, so I can, I guess, I can excuse that. And I think it was still a fun read. It never really dragged for me. Like I, I also like that I read it in a couple of days. Something would always happen, even if I didn't really agree with or like what was happening like i felt like it moved along pretty well and kept me engaged yeah there weren't a lot of dead thoughts that's that's one good thing i would say about it is that it's pretty much like there's always something happening so you're never bored necessarily with the action even if you're like confused or disappointed by what's going on yeah yeah i'll agree with that it definitely had good pacing it was i think more the content that was the disappointment like pacing was good but yeah. Okay. What's our next point to start on? Well, we've talked a lot about world building, but I don't know if we want to go into that a little more, because um, I know that was the biggest sore spot for a lot of us was just like the feeling. I know for me specifically, I was really bothered that this was another book that was like, here's this horribly, completely and totally oppressive regime. Um, and we're going to have just a couple of the people fighting against it, even though reality tells us that if that was actually happening, there would be a lot of people fighting against it. Um, mm-hmm. What I find most compelling in these sort of rebellion stories is when the corruption of the government is somewhat more subtle. So the people who recognize what's going on are much more compelling because they see what other people are unable to see. Whereas in this world, it was more just that like, Either everybody had drunk the Kool-Aid or people just didn't care. Like, it was really unclear to me whether what was going on, especially in the military academy, was, like, apathy or if people actually believed, like, what they were doing, um, which was something that bothered me a lot because I was like, you know, you're putting, like, all of these kids are doing pretty evil crap and working for this really really terrible evil regime that's basically stifling literally everything other than people's ability to kill each other and people didn't really seem bothered by it at all and it was unclear if anyone like ever was or why they weren't bothered by it and so that kind of like irked me because i, I totally agree with you like yeah even normal people in this world like doing normal things so is everyone just like crazy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I sort of like looked at it and went, do they all just like sit and cower in their houses? Or do like what exactly? I think there just wasn't enough given. And I think this all ties back into world building again, that there wasn't enough given about like what life was actually like just among the people. Mm-hmm. And I, 
unfortunately, because Laia is like stripped away from it so quickly, all we really see is Black Cliff Academy or whatever it's called. And that's sort of just like, oh, hum, oh, ho, hum, you're other run of the mill militaristic campground. I mean, there's nothing really unique or interesting about it. And I thought she was trying to actually go like replicate Sparta. I like, I get that, but. Even then, Sparta still had a, like its own life outside of that militaristic aspect. Yeah, I don't think the Spartans were just like killing scholars for reading books. I don't think yeah. that was happening yeah, so in Sparta. Outside of this whole like no reading books thing, what really were they doing like to impress the people that they conquered? I honestly like can't remember anything being mentioned. Yeah, I don't think it ever was. No, I mean, like, literally the world building consisted of there were scholars and there was military. There was apparently well, nobody really in between, and the scholars they, had they, been they said conquered. They said tribesmen were in between. Right, there was some tribesmen, but okay. they are not from the city, right? But they were, yeah, they were technically from a different land, from I thought. Desert. They were, like, outside the empire. Them. They, like, rolled up and then rolled out real fast, and I just went... You know, those guys were actually interesting. Oh, that's why they had to leave. I think okay. there were in the next book, maybe. But yeah, there were just a lot of things that were just mentioned, and we really didn't get to see anymore. So we kind of forgot that they existed. Yeah, the, the sad part is, is they were mentioned, but there wasn't really any promise made upon them. Because I think if you're going to bring in subtle little side details and side characters because they're going to come back later, you need to sort of make a promise with them to sort of incorporate them enough so we're going, oh, maybe we'll see a little of you later, like I think we're going to. But in this one, it's just sort of, it felt very non-cohesive, like, oh, they pop in, oh, they pop out, oh, this happened, this happened. I'm going, how does this all blend together? Because it's not cohesive. It's, it's yeah. it felt very random. Yeah, so without doing spoilers, I hope, there was one character that was a tribeswoman that appeared, you know, probably two-thirds of the way through the book that was probably the most interesting character introduced in the entire book. And what bothered me about her is not only that she was interesting, but she was present for, like, maybe five pages, um, but that it didn't seem like really anything happened with her. Like, it was this weird, like, here's an introduction to a really cool, like, mysterious and interesting character bye she's gone now and <laughs> like but and and like even within the, like the little episode though like she said something to the characters but it wasn't even anything that was like particularly weighty or important to the story it was just like hi i'm here bye and that was really weird to me and i think that was one of the examples of like the sort of the randomness of what was going on I think that was part yeah. of like you know her at being a debut author, kind of trying to figure out how to do these things. Like, it seemed like she was trying to foreshadow her for her next book, but we, yeah, it kind of fell flat. Although I yeah. do, I just want yeah. to see more of her, that character, so maybe it was successful in that. Yeah, yeah I think it's... Interest, yeah. The sad thing is that I think I was so interested in her because everybody else was so painstakingly dull, um, or at least so, like, Cliche. Yeah, thank you. Cliche and vacuous. I was just like, I just, thank you. Someone who's even showing me a glimmer of depth. I just sort of latched onto them like a drowning man. I was like, please <laughs> give me something. Like, I wanted this book. I, I, as much as I was very frustrated with it, I kept wishing it would give me something. It was like, again, that whole pro that whole potential that's not delivered upon. There were all these glimmers of things that I went, please just deliver upon it. And then sadly, no. But there, I mean, even, yeah, I mean, because most of the side characters every now and then could be maybe interesting. And I would maybe want their POV in the next books, however many there are. I have like one point. About mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. Uh, not the world building, thing, but I got the impression that the Empire was actually not that big. Yeah, it didn't seem like it was that big because I think that they went from like basically one side of it to the other. Except no, because the emperor was coming from somewhere. Yeah, the capital was This is like a semi-spoiler thing, but when the emperor is like coming towards Black Cliff, it, I got the impression it was a long journey. Yeah, because they were like, they had enough time to make like these plans that clearly took a while. So you assume it's some sort of long trek. And clearly there are no cars that will get him there fast. So, well, yeah. It seemed like as in the timeline of the story, it was a month between when it was first mentioned that the Emperor was coming and then when what eventually happened, happened. Mm -hmm. So, 
But but I don't know if he was actually coming from outside of the Empire, because I agree with Aki that I also got the impression that the Empire was extremely small. So that was a really confusing sort of dissonant thing that was happening, where you got the impression that people could literally walk from one side to the other of this empire pretty quickly. But then when you had two forces that were supposedly coming into confrontation, it would take a month for that to happen. Yeah, the so that was, was weird. not very helpful like, in that regard. It sounded, it sounded like basically the empire was founded by like this tribe that like took over the city, whatever the name of the capital is. And then it was like a smaller city before, and then they conquered it and like just built their capital there. And like, that was all. Yeah, like, I'm looking at the map now, and there's only a couple places that are really, like, I look at them and I see walled cities, and I'm going, there's really no way for me to tell how far apart these things are supposed to be. Um, I mean, they seem to be, like, some are a little closer than others, but, like, Black Cliff is kind of, like, dead smack in the center of this. Um, so Black Cliff is really its own city, except for it's in Sarah, I believe. Oh, yeah. Um, S E R R A, and you've got a couple others. You got like Antium, Adisa, Aish, Mur, Hai, uh, and Tiboram. Like all these names, they're so like it, it's not cohesive. Oh, it's gonna drive me bonkers. Well, I think but, partly because not all of those cities are in the empire. It's I, been, at least one of the ones you said I thought was supposed to be in like the tribal land. Aish looks like it's pretty straightly in the tribal desert, but like yeah. Avium and Tiborum and all this. I mean, this looks like it's supposed to be just the empire. But even then, what the empire is in terms of what it is, much of it is the empire, isn't clear. It, which is actually very frustrating now that I'm taking the time to really look at this map. <laughs> There's a dotted line that I think represents the border. The borderlands... Okay, it's well then. Technically, it looks like the tribal desert is a part of the empire <laughs> because I don't see anything separating tribal desert from the massive the empire in the center. Yeah, You've got my I mean, technically, but like they they said they like they ruled in a very hands off way. That would make sense. I mean, it's hard to control them if they're nomad- nomadic anyway. Yeah, true. But the, the five people were ruled in a hands-off way, right? Because obviously yeah. the other people are not. Yeah, because even looking at the tribes, they the only thing that looks close to like one of those classic walled cities that are in everything else, um, it's Aish and Sa, which I'm probably pronouncing very poorly. Um, but yeah, I guess yeah. Whatever. I'm going to stop looking at this map because I, I'm not going to keep making sense of it. Okay. What about like characters? I mean, I think we're going to have a whole bit dedicated to Helene because I, that, that woman is the only reason I'm still really reading. But I want to say that some of the characters I thought had potential to be really interesting. Like I kind of wanted the commandant to be interesting. I was really hoping she would be just because it was kind of neat to see it as a female led organization. Um, but she kind of struck me as, uh, I know Rebecca has read The Queen of the Tearling, um, but I don't know if anybody else has. There's a, the antagonist of that is called the Mormesna Queen, and the Commandant reminded me of her a lot. Um, well, it's like, see, Cersei this is where I'm gonna disagree with you. Because, really? Um, because I think, like, I understand why the Commandant and then the Red Queen would be similar in your mind, but I felt like the Red Queen, perhaps because you actually get her perspective in the Queen of the Tearling and Invasion mm-hmm. of the Tearling, but she felt much more developed and deeper to me oh, and, like, yeah, real character, where she had a where she had a clear motivation and she had moments of weakness and mm-hmm. she had her moments of cruelty, whereas the Commandant, like, you get a little bit of this background that like something happened to her. Um, but otherwise she's basically just evil and there's not really a reason given for it. She's just kind she's of kind like of this cool straight show. up cool person. And that's like it. And there's never really a glimmer of anything else that you get from her or even really a reason for why, except maybe when like that, whatever nightshade or nightbringer or whatever <laughs> is we don't in briefly <laughs> like anything else about. Um, yeah but yeah but i don't know if we should before we talk more about characters we should end this portion and go into our spoiler portion because i think it's kind of hard to talk about characters without talking about specific instances how do you guys feel about that yeah i say let's just dive into the spoiler deep end of the hole all right okay so anyone who's listening we're moving now into the part where spoilers are going to run rampant so don't continue if you don't want to be spoiled 
Yep. Cover those ears with mandrake earmuffs and run away. <laughs> yes, and they have to be pink and fluffy. Yeah, okay, so I see what you're saying, Becca, about how with the Queen of the Tearing, at least, we get a lot more from the Mortmez than the Queen, and I agree. I think it's more kind of on a shallow level. I see them as, like, very similar in some of their actions, but I agree that the Red Queen is far more developed. Um, she's just an actual human being and interesting. Whereas the Commandant, and God, I hate calling her that because that is not a term from the Roman army, and it just bothers me, um, but <laughs> she was... She was just kind of like this nasty, evil shrew who just lorded over everybody. And I, I said, there's there's just not enough here for me to understand why. And right. I almost want her perspective, though. Like, I feel like she could be interesting. Like, there has to be something interesting under there. If there's not, I'm that's going to be, oh, goodness gracious, that would be terrible. But I think there's something interesting in there. And I really actually kind of want her perspective more than almost any of the others yeah uh, so i think what was interesting is that glimmer of like right at the end there when she visits elias in the prison cells yep um and you get the little story of how you know she's always hated him which was like kind of surprising i think because as a reader i was sort of expecting this to be almost a reconciliation moment and it very much was not yeah. Um, and so on the one hand that was a little bit satisfying to me because it was unexpected and it was surprising but on the other hand I was like but seriously like this woman is just like a two-dimensional evil like shrew basically but she did say something about like it's never like mentioned exactly what happened but it's implied that Elias was born out of a rape or something else that was severely unpleasant which yeah. doesn't necessarily excuse her like crazy psycho evilness, but um, at the her. same time, it might be an interesting background, a piece that like could make her seem deeper or at least explain a little bit about her. But I don't know that it can, the way the story is told, that if you don't ever get her perspective, you could ever really get anything deeper from her yeah unless they were to do like a massive expository dump which would just be a nightmare um and i agree in that what clearly something very unpleasant happened and i caught the whole like it's implied that she was he's a product of rape um but and it definitely doesn't excuse any of her actions but it certainly i think makes her attitude towards him a little more understandable at least in terms of being like okay i think i get your hatred of him but but it, it still doesn't excuse anything it's like trying to say that like i don't know hitler made paintings so <laughs> that's cool but but you know he still killed a ton of people <laughs> and it's for her i'm like okay i'm very i like i feel horrible that this horrible thing probably happened to you but you're still killing like a ton of people and you clearly have some serious megalomaniac issues to work out yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I also got the impression that it's probable she got, like, raped. But she also said at some point, like, she was disappointed in love. Well, it, love sucks. Or something along those lines, too. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if that's just the case, and, like, she had, like, an unsuccessful, like, love thing and got pregnant, then, like, it's a lot less, like, desirable for her to... Oh, like, man, that would... Yeah, that would just be like, oh, wow, really? I think I would be... I'd actually fling a book at the wall if that ended up being the case. But she seems to have had, like, prior to that, like, issues with her father. Yeah. And and the thing was, I wondered where they were going with that. I'm like, is this supposed to be a gender thing? Like, you could play it that way. I said, except she's very clearly much in control and in power here. And we even have characters like Helene, who are very intense, very strong and complex female characters who are in positions of at least physical power in relation to the other people there. But and it like, must have been very honorable for her to be the only woman selected in her generation right. as well. And that thing, yeah. The only so, one woman in a generation yeah. thing? Where yeah. did that come from? Why? Who knows? Never explained, <laughs> guys. <laughs> Remember? Yeah. <laughs> oh. In fact, it's just more weird that there's a woman at all because, like, if it's based on ancient Rome, like, yeah, then no way. <laughs> but I almost wonder if that was like almost a weird plot device because she wanted to have, so she needed Elias's mom. 
to be the bad guy. So obviously there had to have been a woman in her class because that's how she became the commandant. And then if yeah, that makes sense. Then they need a Helene. Yeah. Who ended up being like all Helene is the super interesting character. And the like and the sort of like under the relationship between Helene and Julius wouldn't have been the same. If mm-hmm. Helene was a boy or Helene, how do we say this? Do we know how to pronounce See, it? I w- I've been saying Helene just because that is a classical Helene? pronunciation, but I heard someone else call her Helene, and I'm like, I don't know. No, I said Helene. Like, I, I, I gave it a more French pronunciation. But yeah, yeah, which like, makes sense. I know, like, a Helene, but she's um, from Lebanon, so, I, so Helene sounds more Hellenistic. So I think from the from the panel yeah. I went to today, uh, I think the author said Helene, but okay. I don't, okay. I mean, no one really cares. So pronounce it how you like. <laughs> yeah, whatever. She's her poor name will get botched, and this poor fictional character will deal with it. She's just like straight up. The, I was joking with her my hashtag Goddess Queen because I just went. This girl is very kick butt, and I like her a lot. I said, and the fact that we are getting her POV in the second book is like, okay, thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Because of, because Laya was such a disappointment mm-hmm. that uh, Helene will more than make up for me having to read or skim read Laya chapters like I did in this book. I skim read Laya's chapters a lot. Um, I sort of flew through them because I was only half reading them. Um, but Helene was such a great character. And if the Commandant was only, being a woman was only a plot device so that we could get Helene or just so we could have uh, Elias's or Elias's mom in there. Then it, it, because that produced Helene, I will minorly forgive that. <laughs> because we got her. I will forgive this. Oh, gosh. Though, seriously, though, why didn't Elias end up with Helene? I'm sorry. Someone needs to explain this to me. I mean, this was this was my favorite thing about the Google Doc is that um, <laughs> everyone had like these really intense, long like comments on all of our plot points, and then Aki put in his only comment was, "But why?" Was that? <laughs> <laughs> it was so great, and it was like, okay, but really, like that's really what everyone is wondering at the end of this book. Like, what just happened? Well, guys, there's, there's still time. There's at least one more book, maybe up to three more books. Who knows? All right, are we going to call Elias and Helene as, like, endgame? Like, I don't... I would freely call them as endgame, but I have a really bad feeling like Helene will die in, like, the third book or something. Well, is, is Helene going to, like, have to, like, get with the uh, Emperor, whose name I forgot? Yeah. Mario. Well, yeah, he's I hope not. That. Oh, this is gross. Well, she's never going to... Okay, so she's never going to, like, get with him, get with him, at least not willingly. We know that from her, like, I think we know her well enough from her story to know that she is way above that. But on the other hand, because she's now sworn to him as the blood shrike, then I'm guessing there's going to be potentially a pretty unpleasant dynamic there because he clearly wanted her in every way of the word. However, how much, like, there was a lot that was suggested and then shied away from in this book. So I really wonder... Again, like someone was talking about, like everyone just felt too safe. Like there was like this constant threat of violence and rape, but then you kind of knew nothing was ever really going to happen to the main characters. And so yeah. I wonder if the same thing is going to happen with Helen. Like even though there's this suggestion that now Marcus is going to have this like sexual control of her, um, if that's not actually going to happen because nothing actually happened. Yeah. Right. No, that that makes a lot of sense. Actually, you're you're right. And yeah, I, I think a couple of us pointed out how the violence just was either very abrupt and brief and it would sort of fizzle out and there were very few consequences to anything, like really serious ramifications and consequences just didn't exist. I think the worst thing that happened, this is for me personally, was when Marcus had to kill his brother. I do actually... I found that a little moving in that I went that okay that yeah but even so but the thing is that even that happened sort of like off screen as it yeah. were yeah so everything that did happen so like what was her name Izzy who was missing the eye whose eye was yeah. taken out oh. by the commandant and all of that like either happened off screen or before the book began mm-hmm. um which was weird 
to I me. That stuff, yeah, you would only want to show because it raises the stakes. And it really means that, like, people have, well, quite literally put skin in the game. And that, and again, just raising the stakes. It, it sort of felt like everything had already happened. And we just sort of got dropped into the, the later bits. And I went, oh, okay, but you need to give me something. And even the beginning, which is Laya's, you know, the destruction of basically what's left of her family. Um, That's true. It, that did happen. And I forgot that. About did that. happen on screen, but it was, again, it was so perfunctory. Like, it, it sort of happened, and then we moved on from it very quickly and left it all behind. I think as Brandon Sanderson once said, he goes, you drop people in media res, like super, like paragraph of interesting and then brick of boring. Like, that's sort of what happened with Laia. Because like, we had that excitement of the beginning and then it was just like a brick for the rest of the storyline where she was pretty much insignificant to most of the overarching plot. And I think it, I, I don't remember if it was Shelley or Aki who mentioned that, um, Miss here said she had a hard time writing Elias's perspective, like didn't enjoy yeah, it all. That's what she said. She said he was a hard, harder. Yeah, that's, a, that's yeah. so disappointing because his storyline was the one where stuff happened and it was actually really interesting. Um, even if his that field said his, I mean, his storyline is interesting, but he was like a stupider character than Laya. Oh, he's really a complete dumbass. I mean, great. So was Laya. I pretty much thought she was like a wooden plank. I just okay, okay, but seriously, I, I'm really curious. Is that just because he didn't end up with Helen, or what else makes him really stupid? He didn't realize that he, if he like became emperor, if he actually tried, like he could do a lot more to like change things that way. Like, like, what is the good of being like? Some random dude who's just like, yeah, he was sort of like, yeah, of course he even started. Like, he was just assuming that he couldn't do anything, like, nothing could change with the system, and that it was just the best thing for him to save himself and just, you know, leave, run away. In a way, he's kind of like the extreme of the reluctant hero, but to the point that there's very little that, like, actually happens with him. I mean, he's just reluctant the whole way through, and it's very much like, kind of like Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games, and that she's very much the reluctant hero through the whole thing, and she refuses to accept some sort of serious role for the majority of the storyline. And Elias, I'm like, dude, if you're but telling me I can become... Uh, sorry, what were you saying, Aki? Yeah, but Katniss is still like kind of like on the boat though like, with, like yeah she's Katniss. a little more proactive at least and sort of like okay i'm gonna roll with this begrudgingly but i'll roll with it he's just sort of just like i'm like dude if it were at me and you come to me and say hey i need you to become emperor because maybe you could actually make a frexing difference i would be like i don't know how i feel about this but i'm willing to listen at least he was sort of unwilling to even listen to people try and tell him this it seemed like there's some changes you couldn't make even if you became emperor because like the whole system was set up by the augurs like maintained by them like it didn't seem like you had a choice of whether if you wanted to abolish that academy or like not have a blood strike or like who you could whatever you like blood strike, yeah yeah all that seemed like predetermined by like the system it doesn't make any sense like, <laughs> they, why they went through with it for like 500 years like if the augurs were such a like threat, like I'm sure some emperor would have them murdered. <laughs> yeah. Worse. What was up with those guys anyway? Like, frankly, they seemed super powerful, but then didn't do anything. And I'm just going, I and they talked constantly about things like destiny. And I went, so far, I'm really not getting anything from that. And if they call anybody else an ember in the ashes, I will just. <laughs> I understand it's parallel and it's meant to be nice and pretty, but I actually found it really odd and out of place. And it was, like, so in your face, shoved down your throat when it happened in each instance that I kind of rolled my eyes. I just went, ugh, again. I think that the thing about the others that, like, really, like, rubbed me the wrong way is that they were presented, again, as, like, these super powerful, like, so they can, like, read minds and probe into people's minds and see the future and all of this stuff that seems like it would be really useful. But then they couldn't even do that with, like, the bad guys who were cheating in the games and whatever. Like, oh, we can't read their minds because they learned how to protect their minds from us just, like, randomly. You know, and so it was like, what is the point of having these super powerful characters in here who have these really interesting supernatural abilities if then they're not going to be able to use them? 
and they won't use them. And so it was weird because then there was the whole, like, they set up Elias. Um, they knew he wasn't going to end up being the emperor and winning the trials, but for some reason it was important that he did them because I think the rationale was that then his soul was free. And for some reason, like, he knew that he wasn't going to end up being evil, um, which didn't really make sense to me at all as a plot point. And then I was just really sort of confused in general about Elias because he let them convince him to stay and not run away and participate in the trials. But then he didn't really respect them or listen to them. And he didn't want, like, I just, I don't know, like that whole dynamic between Elias and the augers was just like, what the hell is even going on? What the heck is even going on? Sorry. I, I don't know. <laughs> No, I agree with you. The augers felt very kind of out of place. I have the sneaking suspicion they'll be important later, but I said there's not, a, again, it's just there's not enough here. There's not even enough of a promise to be delivered upon in a coming book. And it, it was very, it, it, everything felt very, very convenient. Like, oh, we're super powerful, so we can't tell you these things. Oh, but by the way, we can't actually kill the bad guy's mind because, oh, if we could, we could maybe actually stop something. And that would, why would we bother to do that? Because logic. And everything felt very, like, conveniently, these people can't read the bad guy's mind. You know, conveniently, X happens, and conveniently, person meets person B, and conveniently, Lia and Elias end up together in their little faded love moment and all these it, it was it was ridiculous i'm gonna stop now <laughs> yeah i mean really we really didn't even know why they were helping elias like they they didn't explain that right i'm not just forgetting no they yeah no they really it. didn't explain that well okay they did though in as much as they told both elias and leia or Laya, that they were the embers and the ashes. Oh, right. So I guess that was the explanation for why they were helping them, but what that means, who knows? Yeah. It's like, yes. I'm sorry, you wanted explanation in this book? You wanted death? Are you crazy? Nope, we got some mysterious, like, telepathic monks. <laughs> <laughs> and man, they're not even, like, they're I, immortal I, mysterious telepathic monks. You can't forget oh, yeah, the immortal part. Important. I know. I know. It's like, goodness, they couldn't even be like the Silent Brothers and the Mortal Instruments. At least those guys were explained in, like, their first introduction, even if they were left a bit mysterious. But these guys were just like, oh, hey, immortal, like, telepathic monks. Hey, we're going to peace out now. See ya. And I was like, uh, cool story, bro. Tell it again. Um, right. But that's kind of how I felt about all of the supernatural creatures in this book. Oh, our Nightbringer person? Oh, I, well, yeah. Nightbringer, but then all of this, so what was it, like, the second trial when, like, all of the weird spirity things and everything oh, yeah. came what and were attacking them? That? And they had to fight that. And so, what was, like, it was kind of interesting and in that she was establishing this is a fantasy world, so there is obviously magic and things going on. But then, again, it had no impact. Like, it didn't seem to actually matter at all for the overall story. None of it was ever revisited. It was not important, except because they were there in the second trial. And so, I don't know, like, I just felt like this whole book was an exercise in world building, but that then it just didn't deliver. I don't know, because, like, really, what were, there were, like, eight different mystical creatures that were described in, like, that brief chapter, and then it didn't matter. And then what happened to them, like, oh, no, oh, there was also the ghoul thing that followed Leia yeah. for no reason. Yeah, and even that, yeah, especially with the second trial, because, like, Elias, like, passes out in the middle of it. He wakes up, and Helen's like, oh, by the way, I basically slayed everything for you. Which, well, I mean, she did cool also enough. figure out that she magically could sing, which just made her even, like, better as a character. Yeah, that, I, 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 I really liked that. I'm not gonna lie. I thought that was, I went, ooh, okay, based on sound and music and voice, I went, okay, this could be neat. We're not really going anywhere with this. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I... There were so many things I went, if she'd taken the time to really deliver upon them, could have been really good. And maybe this is the burden of her. I wonder if maybe she kind of spread herself too thin and that she had far too many ideas she wanted to incorporate. And so didn't give enough breathing room for all of them. Uh, like, honestly, you could trim so many elements of this world out of it. 
and then have a much more deep and complex world. It's like horizontal development versus vertical development. And I'm like, I would rather have like one inch of information of a world about a mile deep than a mile of information about this world that's like half an inch deep, which is sort of what this book felt like to me. And if she'd sort of cut maybe a bunch of extraneous elements and other things out and focus more intensely on others, this book actually might have been far more intriguing. Yeah, because this book was actually decently long, long, right? It was almost 500 pages. Yeah, hold on. My hardcover was... It was 446 pages. That's a pretty good length. Oh. Um, most YA fantasies I see hover right around 400, um, but first installments, like, I'd say between 350 and 400. Mm-hmm. So this was pretty long, and it's like a tall hardcover, too, so it's not even like the... Because, like, YA hardcovers tend to be a little smaller in terms of actual physical size, in terms yeah. of height. This one's kind of the same size as an adult trade hardcover. Yeah, and, and like, uh, just thinking back, like, I don't even remember, like, so many things that happened in the book. They just weren't really that interesting or compelling. Like, the whole resistance... <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I think we can just say, what resistance? They were so useless. Oh my goodness. And again, the whole question of Laya's parents being betrayed. It, uh, like it, it felt like they were, she was driving to maybe give you the answer to at least that by the end of the book. And we didn't even get that. No, That's, yeah, you didn't even find out who the cook was. <laughs> like You get yeah. the clues that the cook was like important and she was part of Laya's history and she had known oh her God. parents and had been part of the rebellion. And blah, blah, blah. And who is she? And there's going to be a big answer. No. One, yeah. And not only was there not an answer, but now neither Ilias nor Leia are going to be at Blacksmith anymore. And neither is Helen. So how the F are we supposed to figure out who the heck the cook is? I know. It's going to bother me. Hashtag who is the cook? Someone's <laughs> I need to know. Like, this is important. This is just like... Um, if you happen to know how many, um, like, the proportion of, like, population of, like, scholars to, like... No. Yeah. Like, we don't. that like, Again, I think world building, nothing is really given about this world. Like, I, in my mind, cannot really picture this world. I can't picture what the people look like, what the layout of maybe um, Sera is. I what, can't. What, what I kind of pictured in my head is, do you know, like, Palmyra or Petra? Or like, like, yes. The, the, uh, like, the sort of Romanish cities in the desert. That's the closest thing that came to mind, like, architecturally. Yeah. I think my issue was also just, like, daily life on the street. I can't imagine it at all. I have no sense of really what this daily life culture is. And I think that's important because I need to understand why, who these people are you really want to save. What is it you're trying to create? You need to give me a sense of that or at least what you're trying to get rid of. And even then, like, yes, big, bad, evil, you know, martial-based empire. Like, okay, great. Next. What else? What else? I, I have no real emotional stakes in this story except for Helene. She's my and the tribeswoman. Those are pretty much the only two. That's it. <laughs> Whose name I can't remember. I feel so bad. Did she have a name? Were we given a name? I think we were, and now I'm going to try and find it since I'm holding my book. I will find this. Dang it! I will find this. Uh. <laughs> oh wait, yes, yeah, it's Avia Ara Nur. It's A-F-Y-A. That's her first name. Her last name is A-R-A-N-U-R. Okay. Translates as shadows and light. I sense the significance in this naming here, guys. Ooh. Oh, my. Because the funny thing is, like, war means light in Arabic. So she's very unimaginative in her names. <laughs> Super significant in your face. It will mean something later. She's about as subtle as Chris Nolan naming characters in his movie. Does anyone remember um, <laughs> Elias' tribe's first people name? Maybe uh, that has an interesting translation, oh. too. Dang it! I just okay. closed my book! <laughs> uh, and I could have told you I was on the page! Oh, well. <laughs> not a big deal. We'll probably, I'm sure it'll come up again later. Like, I can't, I can't imagine there not being tribe's people in the next book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what, like the one thing that I get excited about. So even though this book was, it fell flat to me, it was very disappointing. I felt like the potential was there. And the next book, since they're obviously not going to be at the military school anymore, 
Elias and Leia are on the run, so they're probably going to be encountering the tribes people, etc. Like, I feel like that has a lot of potential and could be really interesting. Road I'm trip! Also, I'm also a little worried that it's going to end up not being interesting, and then I'm going to oh, we're gonna get. I'm worried that we're going to waste a lot of time trying to save Leia's brother. Because frankly, I think that's an irrelevant point, and we shouldn't bother. Oh. And mm. I, re- what I really hope is that the second book doesn't waste a lot of time with that. Frankly, they could show up and he could be dead, and I'd be happy because the story would move on. Even though he might actually Darren. be far more interesting than Laya. Darren, right, that's his name. Yeah, yeah, so that was interesting to me is that Darren, like, obviously Laya cared, like, a lot about protecting him or getting him back, and that was, like, the whole point of her plot. Right. And that's what they're going to do right now is go find him. But I, that was another thing that bothered me is that as a reader, I just did not care about him. Because like, we met him for, like, two seconds. So we met him for two seconds, and she was mad at him for half of it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, why am I supposed to be endeared to this character if and the it's like, protagonist isn't right now? And, like, you got to understand that, like, he's her brother, so she feels responsible for getting him back, which is mm-hmm. fine. Like, that's a perfectly acceptable motivation. But as a reader, like, there should be a reason that we care about him being rescued. Yeah. And not for her sake. Like, we have to believe that there's a reason that he needs to be rescued. Well, she did know something valuable about making weapons. Okay. Yeah, so but he's already, did he like, learn that? Did he learn that from Telemon or whatever the, that guy's name was? Spiro Telemon. Telemon. Yeah, and Telemon was, like, perfectly happy to impart all of that information upon Maya. So... He's technically not even useful in that way. I guess. <laughs> like, I don't. I, Lia and her siblings, you two equal useless. Absolutely useless. Good grief. Yes. Telemon, I, I want to know more about him. Can I just get a book that's filled with POVs of the side I'm characters? Sure. Like, seriously, forget Lia and Alias. I can go a whole book without them. I want to know about Telemon, about this tribeswoman whose name I'm going to botch, about Helen. Helena, I'm kinda, like, like, I'm even interested in, like, Izzy. I yeah. feel like Izzy could have a really cool story. Can we change her to the protagonist? Huh. She'd be more interesting. The cook. We clearly need to know about the cook. I would take a whole oh, book. Too much book. foreshadowing. Maybe not a whole book, but... Okay, like, half a book. Mm-hmm. Like, her whole backstory, and then, like, what's happening to her now. I mean, and like I said, I frankly would really like to get the Commandant's POV. Only because I desperately want to understand the antagonist. I mean... There's that saying that the hero is only as good as his or her villain, and yes, I do think it swings both ways, but as you have to give me something in the villain that's at least a little interesting, because I want to know about them. I mean, I don't have to like the character, it's kind of like with um, the Song of Ice and Fire series. I don't like, probably, like, actually like about 75% of the people in that series, because they're all despicable human beings, but they're still <laughs> interesting. So I'm like, I need something that's interesting. Not necessarily whether they're good or bad, just at least interesting. Yeah, so the author did say that there was going to be more of the Commandant in the next book, but I'm, yeah, I'm not really sure how that's going to work in, because I assume Helene is not going to be spending a lot of time at, um... Sorry. He wanted to call it Briarcliff, but, uh, Blackcliff, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I was accidentally calling it Briarcliff in my head for the whole first bit, and I have absolutely no idea why. Well, do you, do you also watch American Horror Story? Because I think that's where I'm going to that's probably it. I've sort of on and off watched American Horror Story. Anyway, I guess, I mean, I see Celine is going to leave Blackcliff and go do politics stuff. So I don't know, like, how we're going to get a look at the Commandant. Well, okay, for movie adaptation, who would go see the movie in a theater? I would say personally, I would not. Okay, it depends. I'm going to go with, it depends on what the trailer looks like. Because what's interesting about movie adaptations, most of them fall flat because they're based on really good books and the movie just can't capture it. But every once in a while, you get a book that wasn't necessarily like that deep. And then the screenwriters do something really interesting with the movie. So I feel like there's a lot of potential here just for them to try to do something cool with the movie. I can see them getting slightly more brutal with it. Um, and for things like the violence aspect to actually like come out in the movie or not. I can also see it going the other way and just being kind of like this thing that just totally falls flat. Like With this one, I don't see how they could really possibly go that much more violent 
and really push it because they're going to desperately want to keep their PG-13 rating. They are not going to want to get that into an R rating because it cuts out so much of the demographic they want to hit. That's true. Um, That's true. So they would probably tame it even more. And even then, what little grittiness they kept, I, I just can't see this making a very memorable movie and it's not something I would pay money to go see in the theater if it popped on the TV screen I literally had nothing else to watch or, or to do in my Ouch. life I would maybe <laughs> sit and watch it or if I were like really like even remotely curious so I don't know I, I don't think I would ever see this as a movie like I can see why I guess why it got optioned and why it got picked up but I just I, I, yeah. Yeah, so I, mean, I think they have the potential to like cut some of the less interesting parts or the parts that, you know, we didn't have any really, like, interest in and maybe focus more on getting us, like, an emotional connection to the characters, which, you know, we clearly don't have mm-hmm. with Laia. Um, and, you know, just things like all the, all of Elias's like, fellow soldiers, um, like, they were mentioned a lot, but we really aren't invested in them, so things like that they could do and play that up. Um, but likelihood is that like just for screen time, I doubt they would oh, because yeah. like I can just see if you're trying to cut this into a two two and a half hour movie, understanding that your fight and action sequences are going to take up a lot of time, you're more likely to actually lose more of this book than gain anything from it. But I can just say that from an adaptation perspective. Although I can also see there's a lot of stuff that happens in the book that probably wouldn't need to happen in the movie. And I could even see if you cut out, like, the second trial completely and almost try to cut out a lot of the supernatural element of it, you could spend a lot more time on character development. You could, but the likelihood of that Whether happening Whether that will happen, really yeah. Soon. Because they need action. <laughs> they need action, it'll stay. Like, if I were seeing them cutting anything, I would see them maybe cutting that whole thing at the Moon Festival. Like, is I mean... As neat as it is. Oh, well, because that's when Elias and Leia, like, really yeah. get into it. Oh, no, other. no, because the beauty of adaptation is you can change stuff. And I could see them instead contriving instances of them meeting in Black Cliff. Because from a production standpoint, it's a lot easier to keep them in Black Cliff. That's true, but I feel like it'll so, be a nice, like, happy little interlude. But she also needs to have the love triangle with Keenan. Who we haven't talked about because he was that important to the story. <laughs> oh, we don't need to talk about him. Yeah, I know. Good grief, the redhead, yeah. But, I mean, frankly, so you have, like, wherever they're hanging out and you have Black Cliff. I mean, because really, I'm looking at this more from a filmmaking perspective. Where I'm like, you want to minimize the production cost. And in doing that, you limit the locations you're filming in. And so, like, it's a lot easier to just contain everything in Black Cliff. Maybe put her in, like, some sewers or something to meet right. the, the resistance and that's it. That's all we really need. And so I don't know. I just maybe again, I'm also clearly very biased in that I was very upset with this book, but I just don't see how this would make for a very compelling piece of cinema. Oh, so what I was going to say earlier is that um, at the panel of that today, she mentioned that she's been editing the script. So the script's already written for this movie. Oh God! Oh God! Yeah. Okay, yeah. And also, I think she, I couldn't quite tell if I heard this right, but I think her brother is one of the producers. Oh, that explains why it is being made into a movie. Yeah, it's with Paramount. If that tells you anything, that means nothing to me. But uh, Paramount's a big studio. They put out a lot of really good stuff, but I really that just means that there's that they've got major backing from a major studio, so there's gonna be money thrown at it, um, which is either a good or a bad thing. Because movies can get big budgets and still sucks. <laughs> Let's see. I guess closing thoughts are like for sequels. Uh, like, what would we would we read them? I mean, as much as I have gripes, I will read them because Helene and the tribe woman whose name I mispronounced, so I won't try. And maybe potential commandant chapters. And I need to know what happened about, with that cook. <laughs> so yes, I would read the sequel. Well, grudgingly. Yeah, I would read a sequel. Um, maybe not as grudgingly. I have no hopes. <laughs> I can be optimistic. So, uh, yeah. So I, I would read it. I hope they'll get some something done in the next book. <laughs> like, go and find out about this, this lost brother, you know, finally finish that, and then get into maybe some, like, politics with Queen. I think that would be really cool if we get to follow her and see how things are actually running and what she can do there. Maybe see her, like, have her eyes open to the reality of the Empire. Oh my god, yes, please. Alright, somebody else. Would you read the sequel? 
Oh, um, I will definitely read the sequel, um, at least the next sequel, um, because I do have hopes. Like I, like I said at the beginning, I felt like there was a lot of potential, um, that just wasn't met, and so I have hopes that some of that potential will be met. I'm really, really, really excited about the Helen Helene. Um, POV chapters, uh, and I do want to learn more about some characters, but I think if the next book doesn't deliver more and there are more books after that, that would probably be it for me. I'd probably just kind of let it go. Spoil it for you. Yeah. <laughs> I would literally just be like, someone tell me how it ends. That's all, that's all I care about. Who's alive at the end? Then, like, who wins? Cool. Next. <laughs> I would probably skim it, like, in a bookstore. <laughs> like, without, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I think I would do that, like Becca said. If, like, the second book doesn't give me anything, I will, like, find the next books in the bookstore and just, like, really quickly skim through them. I think I think she should have published this book. Like, like my conclusion is, like, she should have used this as a draft and, like, then work, like, got an inspiration to, like, work on it and make it better. Well, she, she did say she does, like, so many iterations of rewrites, so, I mean, I can't imagine that rewriting more... I mean, unless she had more input, because she did say she, also that she doesn't have too many data readers, so maybe that's um, part of it. Uh, and I'm curious about her editor. Like, I'm really curious about that then, because, I mean, really, the editor does a lot about making sure stuff is, like, working. And I'm like, I mean, Penguin is a big publishing house. They're not dummies. And so I'm. it, it sort of baffles me that something like this could be put out and hyped so much. It is baffling, but I do have to say that compared to especially a lot of young adult fantasy that I've read, this was like above and beyond. Um, it was like it felt flat. It felt very two dimensional. There wasn't a lot of depth to the characters, but otherwise the writing was like leagues ahead of what some of her peers do. So, <laughs> so I can see, I don't, the hype I think was too much. Like, especially when you have books out there like, the Lumetere Chronicles by Melina Marchetto, which are literally like flawless. Oh, Finnegan of the Rock, right? I just I finished yeah. reading that. They're just incredible. So when you have that, it's hard to look at an ember in the ashes and say like, oh yeah, this is a really good fantasy. But at the same time, I can see how an editor would read through it and say, oh yeah, people are going to like like this. This is fine. Yeah, like, I suppose. Is. Yeah, I guess I can agree with you that I can see why it's likable, though I will disagree about young adult fantasy in general and that her writing is leaps ahead i think it's fairly on par with a lot of what i've read um i mean there are some instances where it's a little better in terms of like word and construction but it sort of felt very on par with a lot of the stuff i've read i mean there's some great ya fantasies i mean like the winner's crime trilogy does or winner's curse trilogy does some great things um snow like ashes which was a debut this past year by sarah ross was great i mean there's a lot of really great ya fantasy out there and i just felt like this one i went no this is very forgettable in the pack like i have i'm I'm also just currently staring at my bookshelf and i have an awful lot of ya fantasy i'm like ooh, okay yeah i do read a lot of that um and yeah, I'm but going... the good ones, I would say the good ones are really good, but there's just like a huge, huge volume of YA fantasy literature that's just terrible. That's like... true, and there's an awful lot of it published. So we're still kind of yeah. in the age of the YA dystopian, though it's starting to die out a little in favor of the YA fantasy, which I actually find a little exciting because I wasn't a huge fan of the YA dystopian. Um, but i don't know i just don't think it's on par with the majority of stuff that at least i have read um i mean i can't speak for everything that's published because obviously i don't read everything that's published but um i don't know for me personally with what i've read it was just kind of like eh, it was it was average yeah. i wasn't okay. really blown yeah i don't think the author really had much to compare it with like it doesn't seem like he's super well read in like fantasy and like knows like what's good and like what's out there that might that's be true disappointing. yeah yeah, and like, I, it's like she said, her family or, or some like friends at most like read, read it for her. Like, I don't think they know either what to compare it to. So it's quite possible she thought it was good, and everyone around her thought it was good, and like, like they didn't know otherwise. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like, she, well, but you would think that like the publishers that are hyping it and everyone that's hyping it wouldn't know what's good. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah and, and these are people who would. I mean, those people usually know what's up, especially when it comes to YA, because it's such a hot thing. I mean, it, I hate to say it like that, but it is. So, I mean, you want to know what's up, because those books are getting devoured by people. And so it's like, don't you want that to be one of those things? Instead of something that sort of falls flat on its face, which from what I've gathered, I from what I've gathered of reviews of this book from people I've watched or read, um, they either pretty much love it or they're kind of like, they're kind of like we are, where we're just kind of like, eh, meh. It still it does have a pretty good rating, you know, on average. Its pre-release reviews were all really positive. Yeah, like there's a ridiculous amount of five-star reviews. So, I mean, it, I, I guess it appealed guess, to, you know, certain demographics. Mm. Well, I guess it did its job then. Ugh. Oh, well. <laughs> all right, any final thoughts? I'm good. Yep. No, I got I got nothing else to say. All right. You guys are awesome, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. 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 The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you liked this podcast, rate us on iTunes, or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. See you next time!